Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our sterile packaging education extravaganza. I'm Adam Okada from Beyond Clean. Before we get started with this next presentation, I'd like to call everyone's attention to the features on your screen. All of the windows that you see are movable, so feel free to shrink, enlarge, or move them around to make your event experience fit to your preferences. On the lower left, you will see a Q&A window. Throughout the presentation, we encourage you to send in your questions for the speaker to ask during our Q&A session at the end. In the upper right, you will see a resources window where you'll find additional uh, resources to download and access that are provided to you by our event sponsor, 3M. Our next speaker is Dr. Brian Kirk. Dr. Kirk is a managing director of the Brian Kirk Sterilization Consultancy Group and is qualified as a pharmacist. His postgraduate studies include a master's degree in pharmaceutical analysis and research into the application of computer technology for modeling steam sterilization processes and monitoring and controlling steam sterilizers. He worked for over 10 years in the UK NHS as a quality control pharmacist for a hospital and pharmaceutical sterile company manufacturing department, gaining qualified person status as a result of this experience. He joined 3M Healthcare in 1989 as a development scientist uh, for the sterilization products with a special responsibility for monitoring the development of national and European standards relating to sterilization. During his time with 3M, he has held a number of additional responsibilities, including European technical service for sterilization supporting customers and business teams. Brian is also a member of a number of BSI, CEN, and ISO committees responsible for developing standards for chemical and biological sterilization indicators and steam sterilization processes. Brian has presented at a number of national and international conferences and is a registered authorizing engineer in decontamination. Dr. Kirk is going to expose the chemical contaminants found in the water that you are using to clean and sterilize your department's medical devices. Is your department meeting the current water quality requirements? The answer might surprise you. So let's welcome in Dr. Brian Kirk. Well, uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, and thank you for that uh, introduction, Adam. Um, so the uh, title uh, of my talk today is Water Quality and its Importance in Decontamination um, Processes. So first, I, I have to read some disclaimers. Um, the, the contents of the talk uh, are based on US, but also international regulations, standards and guidance. Uh, so the specific requirements of some countries may differ. Always consult the instructions when using specific products. And I'm going to give you a, a general overview of information. So the content should not be relied upon in isolation to make specific decisions on practice or, or product utilization. So as uh, our host kindly explained, uh, my name's Brian Kirk. I've been in the field uh, of sterilization for uh, 40 years. Um, goodness help me. Um, uh, as Adam mentioned, I, I gained a lot of practical experience in the uh, UK hospital sector, followed by 30 years of experience in 3M, and now I run my own um, sterilization consultancy company. So, um, our learning uh, objectives today are shown in this slide. And uh, what we should understand is that water is used extensively throughout the hospital environment and none more so than in the decontamination processes used to clean, disinfect and sterilize reusable medical devices and surgical instruments. In today's presentation, we'll consider the quality of water and its impact on the efficacy and efficiency of some of the processes used in these decontamination processes. We cannot really separate the quality of water from the quality of steam from which it's generated. So I, I will point out now that I'm going to talk a little bit about how the quality of water can impact the quality of steam and in turn consider some of the contaminants that might be in steam, uh, which can affect the outcome of, of our sterilization processes. 
So here you can see our learning objectives. We're going to uh, consider water quality attributes, contaminants which might be present, chemical, biochemical, microbiological, what purification methods are available, where water is used in the uh, sterile service department or sterile processing department, um, what should disinfect processes, including final rinse water, endoscopy cleaning processes, and then uh, at near the end of the presentation, some information about steam generation and how if we carry out steam generation correctly, we can end up with good quality steam, which means that uh, we will not recontaminate our products after we've sterilized them. And this is just a, a list of the contents which reflects the, um, the, the learning objectives. So, uh, water is H2O. Uh, everybody learns that at uh, elementary school. And it's a very effective solvent for in inorganic compounds. And some of the charged organic compounds of biological origin. If we consider that 95% of our bodies are made up of water, this would explain why many biological molecules um, will dissolve in water and that why it's such a, a useful solvent for cleaning and decontaminating instruments. There are, of course, a few exceptions like fats or some of the um, higher molecular weight uh, materials that we find in our bodies, such as some of the proteins, which will adhere quite strongly to surgical stainless steel. The inorganic salts, which can be found in water, would include the monovalent sodium and potassium salts, the divalent cations, such as calcium and magnesium, uh, and these are often called the water hardness salts um, because they uh, contribute to uh, reducing the effectiveness of soaps and detergents. And of course, we're all familiar with the clogging up of our kettles at home uh, with scale which is resulting from those hardness salts uh, coming out of solution. There are then a, a number of organic compounds which dissolve in water. And uh, there are many such uh, compounds and, and they're largely regarded as contaminants. So you might find uh, some organophosphorus compounds from agricultural chemicals or the naturally occurring fulvic and humic acids, the chemical um, formula for which you can see in the top right hand corner of this slide. Um, and these are typically found in water, which is abstracted from peaty soils. So if you live, live in a moorland area and your water company abstracts water from uh, the ground, then you might find these humic and fulvic acids present. And, and generally they give a, a, a brownish stain uh, or colour to the water. And of course, uh, if used unpurified, they can uh, then stain the materials that, that come into contact with them. Then, of course, we need to consider microbiological contaminants, of which there are many, but typically the ubiquitous waterborne organisms like the Sunabonads, uh, and sometimes coliforms, which can be a marker of faecal contamination, particularly in agricultural areas uh, where water is abstracted from uh, the uh, spill off from hillsides and so on. There are lots of different water qualities and most descriptions relate to the level of contamination. This naturally occurring waters can come from spring water, streams, rivers, boreholes, reservoirs, etc., all of which will have different types and levels of contamination. Then there's the ubiquitous potable water um, or drinking or tap water, which uh, is now called wholesome water in, in a new ISO standard for water quality. The potable water has contaminants present, but most water companies will control 
these contaminants at a defined level. Um, and very toxic materials are excluded. The problem is different countries and different areas within a given country will have different specifications for potable water. And of course, some may not have a source of potable water at all. So when we come to means by which water can be purified, generally, one of the simplest methods is called softening. And this means the removal of the divalent cations responsible for water hardness. In this process, the calcium and magnesium uh, cations are exchanged for sodium. So other contaminants will be largely unaffected by this process. Then there are the more um, involved purification methods, um, which involve the use of uh, reverse osmosis type processes, deionization and distillation. And of course, these uh, processes will remove contamination levels to very low levels. So let's consider standards for uh, water quality. Well, there are many standards which describe water quality. Your local, national uh, and um, regional guidelines for potable water will be in existence. But from the point of view of using uh, professional grade water, then probably the pharmacopoeias uh, are probably the best known. However, there are also national guidelines, such as in the UK, which is where I'm based, we have what are called health technical memoranda. And of course, in the US, you have your uh, AAMI TIR 34 document, which um, describes uh, water for reprocessing and medical devices. And um, interestingly, the ISO uh, International Standards Organization has recently introduced um, uh, a work item for the development of uh, water for uh, decontamination processes. So that, that is in the process of being drafted. So in the hospital environment, water purification is very important. And two typical technologies which would be used would include reverse osmosis and deionization. In reverse osmosis, impure water is pressurized and that forces it through a semi-permeable membrane, which is essentially acting like a, a filter at the molecular level. And this uh, water will pass through the semi-permeable membrane, but the salts and materials dissolved in it will not pass through. So you end up at the um, exit end of this technology, uh, fresh water, which is purified and can then be used in further processes. The problem is that the membranes of these, uh, deino, uh, these reverse osmosis systems can get clogged up because obviously they are acting like filters. And so uh, as they filter out particulate material, uh, they will get clogged. And similarly, bacterial contamination can degrade the uh, membranes uh, to a point where they become ineffective. So generally speaking, with an RO system, you need to have a backflow uh, maintenance type um, process, which will clean the membranes when they're not in use. Deionization is a, another method for purification. And in this technique, a bed of ion exchange resins is used to swap cations and anions for hydrogen hydroxyl ions, and thereby reducing the salt level. So very pure water comes out of the other end of these processes. Again, some level of pretreatment is desirable uh, in order maybe to remove organic compounds. So an activated carbon filter would be used. Um, but uh, one of the problems with deionization is that the systems require regular regeneration using acid and alkali washes um, to remove uh, the cations and anions and restore the resins back to their starting point. So at some point in the day um, or the work period, a, uh, a regeneration process may be needed. In some cases, um, many people will just use um, ion exchange resin pods, which they swap out on a regular basis uh, with a, a supplier or manufacturer. 
Now, distillation, of course, is also possible. It's very rarely found in a sterile processing department. It's typically used in um, the pharmaceutical sector for producing ultra pure water and single and double distillation may be used to make sure the water is very, very pure. So as we all know, um, there are a, a large number of reusable medical devices and some of which uh, are shown in these pictures. And all of these require some form of decontamination after use to remove the patient's tissues and uh, debris, uh, which arises from the procedure. Now, the majority of these are cleaned, disinfected, and sterilized in water-based processes. But before we move on, let's try and understand three terms which are commonly used in this field. The first is cleaning, and cleaning is defined as the removal of contaminants to the extent necessary for further processing or for intended use. Now, that is a relatively vague definition, I think you would agree, um, because it's, the, it's, it's suggesting that the level of cleanliness is related to how the instrument will be used. And so really a judgment is then needed to decide uh, what level of cleaning is required, although some guidance documents, national and international guidance documents, are now providing uh, some indication of what the level of contamination should be after cleaning. Disinfection is a process which inactivates, generally speaking, vegetative viable microorganisms, again to a level previously specified as being appropriate for a defined purpose. So again, it's a judgment call. But of course, in the field of uh, sterile processing departments, the instruments would be dis disinfected um, before they then go into a, a packing area where they would be inspected and repackaged. So generally speaking, disinfection is designed to remove uh, and kill any uh, potential pathogenic organisms or commensal organisms or environmental organisms which might prove uh, a problem <clears throat> when they're, they're handled by uh, operators. Disinfection does not, of course, inactivate the more resistant microorganisms such as uh, spores, and this is the purpose of sterilization, which is a validated process used to render product free from viable microorganisms, all viable microorganisms. So uh, when we've done our sterilization process in the uh, sterile barrier system that we're going to use, the packaging, then we will end up with a, a sterile product that's ready for use by the uh, next, <clears throat> uh, for in the next surgical procedure. So this diagram shows the cycle of reprocessing. It's commonly used throughout the world, <coughs> and it's describing the recycling process or the cleaning process for a reusable medical device. And we can see in it that there are certain points where we would use water in order to help us with that individual process. So there are many uh, stages in this process that use water, and I suppose the first is when the instruments are returned to the department from the um, operating room. And generally speaking, a manual clean will take place. <clears throat> and this generally uses potable water mixed with detergents in a, in a sink um, by the, the operators who will remove the gross contamination. We have to be a little bit careful if we're using potable water that has um, a lot of hardness associated with it because that can then degrade the efficiency of the detergent. So we need to be aware of the uh, hardness values of our potable water that we're using in the departments. The next step would be disinfection. And in the majority of places I've visited, people after a manual cleaning procedure would then load the instruments into an automated washer disinfector. And this involves uh, several stages. 
Um, the first stages is usually flushing and cleaning uh, with detergents. Um, and then uh, thermal disinfection would take place with purified water. Sometimes um, chemical dis disinfectants uh, are used rather than uh, thermal disinfection for automated washer disinfectors. This depends really on the uh, local practices that, that are carried out by the um, SPD practitioners. And then, of course, we go to moist heat sterilization. Um, the, the majority of reusable medical devices are sterilized in uh, steam. And uh, of course, steam is essentially water in its vaporous form. Uh, so we also need to consider the quality uh, of the water that's used to create the steam, but also the quality of the steam itself. And in uh, looking at this, we need to consider boiler feed water quality, uh, what impacts the quality of steam as we raise the steam, dissolve gases, the water content of the steam and, and boiler water, feed, uh, feed water carryover. And we'll consider this in more detail as we go through the uh, presentation. So how do we clean, disinfect surgical instruments in the decontamination department, the SSD? So I've already mentioned upon return from the operating rooms, the uh, manual cleaning process would take place. And then we'd load our instruments into a uh, washer disinfector, an automated washer disinfector. And you can see that in the top picture there, very similar to uh, domestic dishwashers. Obviously the process is far more uh, rigorous, but the principles are essentially the same. And this process will use a, a cleaning process where uh, maybe the first step is a flushing where gross contamination is removed with relatively cold water to avoid protein coagulation. And then the next step would be carried out at a slightly higher temperature, 40, 50 degrees C, with the addition of detergents in order to um, really rigorously remove any residual tissue from the previous uh, operating room procedure. The next step would be thermal disinfection. And in this stage, purified water would be used at high temperature in order to kill the microorganisms, typically maybe 80 degrees C or 90 degrees C water using, as I say, ultra purified water. And then the final stage is, of course, drying. And this tends to use hot air uh, so that at the end of the process, no residual moisture is present on the instruments. And so they are then safe to handle by the operators who will then inspect them and uh, repackage them ready for sterilization. So if we look at the final rinse water quality um, required for automated washer disinfectors, this table uh, which is taken from the US TIR 34, shows you uh, a column for two different types of water. The first is utility water, and you can see here the uh, levels of hardness, uh, the conductivity, the pH, the presence of chlorides, which are usually controlled because chloride iron will even attack stainless steel and corrode it. And then, of course, we uh, consider bacteria and endotoxins. But if you look at the critical water, which will be used for the final rinse, uh, then the levels are much, much lower. And uh, I would draw your attention to particularly the uh, contamination levels with bacteria, less than 10 colony forming units per mil, and endotoxins, again, less than 10 um, endotoxin units per mil. So let's now have a look at um, endoscope uh, reprocessing and where the water is involved here. Well, this slide shows the reprocessing cycle for decontaminating endoscopes and where the water would be used. So normally, um, 
the, as soon as the endoscope's been used on the patient, the, um, the, the nursing teams, the clinical practitioners, would carry out a, a rudimentary bedside wash. And this might involve just uh, making sure the outside has been wiped clean. And also they may flush through uh, some water through the, uh, the endoscope channels to clear any debris that may have arisen during the procedure. Now, generally speaking, they would use um, bottled purified water for this, sterile bottled purified water. And ideally, that's what they should use because, of course, then there's no possibility of recontaminating the scope with anything um, other than water. If you are using um, potable water, then just be very aware that uh, obviously potable water may contain microorganisms which could then um, be deposited in the channels of the endoscope and also the chemical contamination in potable water has to be considered to make sure you don't build up uh, films inside the channels which could uh, degrade the <clears throat> effectiveness of the scope or indeed the effectiveness of further decontamination processes. Once the scope is transferred back to the reprocessing department, there would be a, usually a manual wash, and this takes place in a, often a sink or a basin with the addition of detergents, again, to, uh, to effectively remove any gross contamination. The scopes will then often be loaded into a, an automated endoscope reprocessing unit uh, which would again have a, generally speaking, a three-stage process, a flush to remove uh, contamination, gross contamination, a detergent wash, um, uh, and often then a um, chemical disinfectant wash, because obviously many endoscopes can't be uh, thermally disinfected. They won't withstand the high temperatures required. But then, of course, uh, a final rinse takes place to remove all of the debris and uh, chemicals used during the uh, earlier stages of the process. And the final rinse water is vitally important in maintaining the quality uh, of the scope after it's removed from the uh, washer disinfector and then put into storage, because um, that is the final step in the decontamination process. So if the scope gets recontaminated, as a result of poor quality rinse water, then that contamination will simply sit in the scope uh, until it's then reused. And of course, uh, some standards um, specify, again, the requirements for um, automated endoscope reprocessor final rinse water. So again, this is taken from the US TIR34, and again, you can see um, the final rinse water requirements specifies the maximum level of bacterial and endotoxin contamination levels. So let's now take a look at um, high temperature sterilization. Now this, of course, is the next big step where water will be used in our reprocessing cycle. Because, as I mentioned earlier, maybe 85, 90% of reusable medical devices are re-sterilized in uh, steam sterilization processes. And in this process, steam at high temperature, typically 132, 134 degrees C, uh, is used and, and pressure up at three bar are used to sterilize the instrument surfaces. And of course, this process is entirely dependent on water in the form of steam. And the quality of the steam can dramatically influence the efficacy of the process and the quality of the product coming out of the end of that process. So let's now consider this in a bit more detail. So I think let's first have a look at how steam is generated, transported to the, uh, transported to the sterilizer and then um, uh, impacts on the load inside the sterilizer. So obviously if we add heat to uh, water in our boiler 
it will begin to produce steam. And then that steam uh, is transferred into the steriliser where it will condense on the surface of our load items. And of course, at this point, if the steam contains any contamination, then as it condenses on the surface of the uh, load items, the stainless steel instruments, etc., then that will deposit any contamination that's contained in the steam on those surfaces. So this is why we need to pay particular attention to our steam generation process in order to make sure that the quality of our steam is of an acceptable level. So I think what we now need to do is look at how the steam itself is generated um, and the points where contamination can occur in this sterilization process. So there's a bit of physics involved here. If we take a mass of water um, and begin to heat it, uh, add energy to it, and we keep everything at constant pressure, then the temperature of the water will begin to increase. And if we carry on heating the water, then the temperature will reach a point when it be the water begins to boil, and we then call that saturated water. It sounds a strange term, doesn't it? But the saturation relates to the amount of energy that the water can contain before it begins to vaporize. So saturated water is a, a body of water that contains so much heat energy that it's beginning to boil. As we uh, continue to add energy, more and more of the water vaporizes into steam. But again, the temperature remains constant. The energy used to vaporize the water is called the latent heat of vaporization. Once all the liquid water is boiled away, we have a volume of steam said to be dry and saturated. It's saturated with energy, but it doesn't contain any liquid water. The stages between having saturated water and dry saturated steam are expressed as a dryness value. So this curve here is showing you the point when we have 100% saturated water leading to 100% dry saturated steam. And it is possible to have uh, intermediate um, values for the uh, steam, which mean that you have a, 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 a body of vaporous steam which has small droplets of liquid water present in them. Now, if we, just as an aside, if we carry on heating that body of steam, then it takes on more and more energy, and uh, it tends then to become very dry and what's called superheated, and it changes its nature. It becomes far less effective at... Um, uh, at killing microorganisms. So again, superheated steam is something that we try and avoid in our sterilization processes. So if we consider the points where um, the water quality has an impact, I'll just quickly click, click through these. The, the first is, of course, down in this bottom left-hand corner, the quality of the boiler feed water. Now, some people might use potable water in their boiler, which means that whatever contamination is present in the potable water will end up in the boiler. And if you have uh, small droplets carried over in your steam, then it will also end up in the steam. And this is why some people would either use uh, purified water, either as reverse osmosis, or certainly softened water to avoid uh, furring up the heating elements inside the boiler. Dry saturated steam will be pure because it's basically vaporous steam without any liquid water present. 
But um, if there are uh, any entrained water droplets present in it, then these could be contaminated with organic contaminants, such as the filming amines that the engineering community might use in the boiler and steam distribution systems, or it might contain endotoxins or inorganic ions, such as iron or heavy metals, which might come from the non-stainless steel pipe work, which is often used in house steam distribution systems. So let's have a look at the dryness value and what impact this can have if it's too low. Well, if we have a steam with a very low dryness fraction, then what this means is that there is too much liquid water present in it. And that means that for a given body of steam uh, mixed with this water, it will have a low energy level and therefore you will get poor energy transfer and therefore poor heating of your loads. And this in turn will have an impact on drying of your loads at the end of the cycle. But of course, of more concern to us today is the chemical impurities present in these small droplets of liquid water that are present in steam with a low dryness uh, value. And the first uh, problem might be um, water arising from condensation of the steam in poorly insulated pipework, or indeed it might be boiler water which is carried over with steam as the steam is generated. So let's have a look at that in a bit more detail. So if condensation takes place in the pipework as the steam is transported to the steriliser chamber, then inorganic metallic salts can be dissolved uh, in the condensate, unless, of course, you're using stainless steel for your pipework, which modern installation would tend to use, but the older installations are probably using uh, standard iron pipe work uh, to transport the steam around the hospital. Similarly, the engineering community might be adding things to the boiler and the steam pipe work to uh, prevent corrosion uh, in the form of filming amines or anti-corrosion compounds into the boiler feed water. And these can be taken up by the condensate as it travels through the steam pipe work. And if we don't get rid of that uh, condensed steam before it goes into the sterilizer chamber, then it will end up on our loads. We can also have water carried over from the boiler, which I think is probably a much greater problem because obviously um, whatever you put into your boiler in terms of feed water, the purity that is, that in turn can be carried over into your steam. So you might have in inorganic ions such as sodium, calcium, potassium, and magnesium, not, not eggs, that should be EG. Um, and the, these are relatively innocuous, but they might leave deposits or stain instruments. We can have heavy metal ions, uh, such as lead, cadmium, strontium, which of course are then potentially toxic to the patient if they end up on the surface of our instruments. And then we can have organic compounds, such as filming amines or anti-corrosion compounds, and these again, could be potentially toxic to the patient. So if, our, if we look in uh, EN285, and I'm sure in uh, AMI TIR standards, the, there are um, requirements for the uh, contamination levels present in the boiler feed water, and you can see this on the left-hand table. And then also, if you were to collect uh, some condensate uh, from the steam, then again, there are limiting values for the chemical contamination in those uh, samples. So again, if you look in this left-hand uh, table, you can see that the contamination levels recommended are very, very low. We're talking about, for example, in lead, 0 0.05 milligrams per litre, um, hardness values of less than 0.02 millimole per litre, and then for the condensed steam, very similar levels, some of them are, are even lower. So <clears throat> the expectation in many of the standards is that we use 
purified water in our feed water <clears throat> and that the steam itself when you condense it and analyze it should not contain high levels of chemical contamination so for sterilization using steam as the primary sterilant there are certain <coughs> requirements we should use saturated steam it should have a dryness value of between 0.95 and 1 and i note in your own U.S. standards, you have a minimum of 0.97 there. The non-condensable gases should be 3.5% uh, or less. Superheat should be less than 25 degrees C, and uh, the steam should be chemically pure. So let's consider non-condensable gases, because um, although these in themselves are not uh, dissolved contaminants, they can be present in the steam and they can be carried into the chamber during the sterilization process and if they are carried into the chamber then if they're in sufficient quantity they can uh, as they as the steam condenses on the cold load items um, you can get the formation of pockets of non-condensable gas within the load which will prevent uh, the action of steam on the microorganisms and therefore potentially a non uh, sterile load. So if we consider the sources of non-condensable gases, they're usually um, created during the steam generation process. So first of all, the boiler water, uh, the boiler feed water could be too cold. Um, cold water dissolves an awful lot of atmospheric gases. I'll show you that in a second. And when the uh, this cold water boils in the boiler, those gases will be released and be carried forward with the steam into the chamber of the steriliser. The other problem is that the feed water might be too soft. And if people are using water softeners rather than RO or deionization systems for the boiler feed water, then uh, as the um, uh, as the bicarbonate, which is created during the softening process, breaks down to carbon dioxide, it will, of course, be carried over in the steam as a non-condensable gas. So if we look at the problem of the boiler feed water is too cold, um, if you look on this left-hand side of the slide, you can see the solubility of atmospheric gases in both cold water and hot water. So nitrogen will dissolve 1 mil, 100 mil, oxygen 0.55. And note that carbon dioxide is very soluble in cold water. And you can illustrate just how much gas is dissolved in your water. If you take cold tap water, which is typically at 13 degrees C, and if you put it in a closed jar and leave it overnight so that it calibrates up to room temperature, you will often see very small bubbles um, attached to the inside surface of the, um, of the glass jar. And this is all of the dissolved gases coming out of solution as the water is heated up. Now, softening boiler feed water is a, a way of um, removing impurities, but it also can create problems because uh, what it uh, means is that um, the uh, car uh, calcium and magnesium carbonate salts will be converted to bicarbonate. And as is shown in this chemical equation at the bottom, when bicarbonate is heated in the boiler, it will turn into sodium hydroxide and uh, also uh, carbon dioxide, which of course is a gas, and that can potentially be carried over in the steam as a non-condensable gas. So let's consider what the ideal method of generating steam is. Well, first of all, um, attention should be paid to the use of some form of purified water in the boiler feed system rather than uh, softened water. Ideally, the water should be preheated to 80 degrees C in a hot well before it is actually fed into the boiler. And this will dis drive off any dissolved gases, as we've seen with those jars 
of tap water. Uh, if you heat the water up, the gases will be driven off. It's very important to make sure that the boiler is correctly sized for the capacity of the sterilizers. If you have too small a boiler, then what can happen during maximum steam demand is you get rapid um, uh, boiling of the water and this will uh, create foam and lots and lots of um, aerosol, water aerosol carried over into the steam supply, which of course potentially can then contaminate the steam supply. Ideally, the steam distribution system should include a steam header, and I'll talk about that in a second. And also, the steam uh, should be supplied with, <clears throat> uh, sorry, the steam supply should have in it um, a way of uh, drying the steam and removing particulates. So, a steam, this is a, a steam manifold. You, you find a picture of this in the UK guidance, uh, the Health Technical Memoranda Number 10. Um, <clears throat> basically, this is a, a long piece of pipe. At one end, the steam from the hospital supply or the boiler passes into this pipe. Um, it will have a couple of points in it which allow the venting of any non-condensable gases. And these are mounted on the top of the pipe. You can see them here. And then at the bottom of the pipe, you will have a sump which will collect any condens that's uh, occurred during uh, the team steam transportation, and that will then allow uh, the condens to flow away. If you note the way this is engineered, the actual steam that's being fed into the sterilizers is taken from the center of this pipe. If you look at the cr cross-sectional diagram at the top left corner of this diagram, you can see that the pipe stub actually um, takes the sample of steam from the center of the pipe uh, rather than the top or bottom of the pipe. And similarly, we can uh, use engineering solutions to remove uh, fine water droplets. This is a, a small impinger system, which, uh, and I thank Spirax Sarco for allowing me to use these pictures. So the idea here is that as the steam enters the device, it will uh, hit uh, um, a vertically mounted plate and as it impinges on the plate water droplets will collect on the plate and flow away so it's an effective way of <clears throat> drying the steam and removing uh, liquid water from the steam now i know that many people will also have steam filters in the steam supply line to remove fine solid particles such as uh, fine particles of corrosion that might have come from um, iron-based pipework. And this again should be mounted close to the steam to chamber valve uh, so that the particles are removed immediately before the steam enters the, uh, the sterilizer chamber. So post-process recontamination is a major, major problem if it occurs. And um, this is a paper written by Dancer in 2012, and she reports on a number of patients that had post-surgical infections, and when they carried out uh, a uh, investigation, they discovered that in the sterilizer, the packs, which you can see in the bottom right corner, were getting recontaminated with condensate that was um, <clears throat> being trapped in pipework and it was splashing onto the surface of the packs. Um, you can see the staining there in the top right corner of this pack. That in turn was recontaminating the load items and allowing bacterial uh, ingress into the packs. And um, that resulted in contamination of the loads, uh, the, the instruments, and therefore, sadly, infection of patients. Luckily, there were no mortalities, but there were some quite serious infections. And this was a, a result of poor maintenance of the sterilizers themselves, but of course it was also a failing in the inspection procedures that should normally have been used in the um, both the sterile processing department, but also the operating theater uh, who should have been inspecting these packs and noticed this staining, which is an, an immediate warning sign 
um, that something isn't as it should be. So, in conclusion, water is used extensively in the processes used to decontaminate reusable medical devices, such as endoscopes and surgical instrument sets. The quality of water can seriously affect the quality of the outcome of processes and should be carefully considered as part of the overall process design and assurance of quality. So on that note, I'll finish my presentation and I'll open the floor up to any questions for the last few minutes of our session. Okay, Dr. Kirk, that was Thank fascinating. You. I think for a lot of us in sterile processing that we have these sterilizers in our department, we know there's problems with them because we see stains, water droplets, all these things that occur um, after sterilization. I just want to say that was uh, learning about the process, learning about what actually is going on inside the chamber and what kinds of things affect water quality is really uh, very interesting stuff. If you guys do have questions for uh, Dr. Kirk, uh, please put them in the ask a question uh, button. I'm going to highlight it here for you on your screen. Um, we welcome the questions. Dr. Kirk is here to answer them. Uh, we did get a few of them in, so I'm going to start with this one here. Uh, this is somebody who I says, I worked with plant engineers that refuse to look at the steam quality because they say by definition, steam is pure and it cannot be the source of staining. The site uh, and that the site was seeing in their instruments and tray liners. So the staining was occurring on instruments and tray liners. They were reluctant to read ST79 or TIR34 because it was not from the ASHRAE world. Do you have any recommendations on how to approach that type of situation? Well, I, I think the, this is uh, not untypical and uh, the, they are, from a, a theoretical and, and pure purist standpoint, they are absolutely correct. And I showed that in my uh, steam energy diagram. That if you have dry, saturated, pure steam, then yes, they are right. It will not contain contamination. But every steam installation I've ever worked with uh, will inevitably not have pure saturated steam in the pipework that's going into the chamber. It will always be carrying some level of moisture with it. And that those liquid uh, droplets will inevitably contain some form of contamination, depending on how they've arisen. It might be that the steam is just con condensed as a, as a result of losing energy, but also it may have been carried over from the boiler or it may have arisen in the pipe work. Um, one of the uh, points that you can make to your engineers is, well, why do all of the standards that I have to work to specify minimum standards for steam quality? And they will inevitably talk about the dryness fraction, the levels of non-condensable gases, the amount of uh, inorganic and organic contamination that's allowed within the steam. So unless uh, there was a problem with these contaminating items, then these standards wouldn't even discuss the matter. So I think the first point is to say, well, look, I have a set of standards that I have to work to. I want my steam testing um, more or less at the point of where I'm going to use it. And <clears throat> uh, th these guidance documents are telling me what the quality of the steam should be. Absolutely. And it, yeah, that's, I think the biggest thing is you can have companies that will test your water. So I think that's probably a really good place to start is testing the quality of the steam that's coming out as close to the point of the sterilizer as you can possibly get it. Um, if staining is occurring on instrumentation, where would you suggest we start looking for the cause? Well, I think the, um, uh, the, the possibility here is that you, you are getting uh, contamination coming in to with the steam supply and um, many sterilizers will have buffer plates uh, fitted on the inside of the chamber to direct the steam in a particular direction to avoid it blasting directly onto the load items. Um, these buffer plates should uh, uh, act a little bit like the impingers that I described in one of my last slides that they will as the steam hits on the buffer plate, uh, any liquid water will collect on it and then fall away into the drain of the sterilizer. So that should reduce the amount of um, liquid uh, water that is going to hit your load and stain your packaging. 
But again, it comes back down to uh, the quality of the steam that's being delivered to your steriliser and trying to improve uh, the uh, quality of the steam before it actually goes into the steriliser itself. Right. And that's a yeah, excellent point. You're improving it before it gets there probably is the biggest thing you want to look for. Um, have you seen staining on the inside of the sterilizer chamber? I know I have personally seen a lot of it. Um, is that a normal thing that just occurs over time? There's going to be a stain of these you know, brown stains on the side of our sterilizer, or is that a direct result of poor water quality? Well, I, th I think, again, it comes back to poor water quality. I mean, I, the, the equipment that I was working with when I was in the development labs, we had stainless steel boilers, we had stainless steel um, uh, stainless steel pipework, the chambers were stainless steel, and we used reverse osmosis water in our boiler. And uh, they looked pristine uh, after several years of use. So I think the staining is again coming back down to, first of all, you need to check what kind of materials your chambers are made of. But if you're getting some kind of staining on a stainless steel chamber, then I think this is pointing you to in the direction of uh, the quality of the steam that's coming into the chamber. So again, look further up line and see if you can improve the quality of the steam before it gets into the chamber. <clears throat> right. Excellent advice. Um, so water softeners. Um, I, I know a lot of departments, instead of fixing the quality of the water that's coming out, instead of fixing the quality of the water coming out of the boiler um, and fixing it before it gets to the steam, a lot of, um, you know, uh, engineering departments will put in these water softeners. What's your stance on that? Well, I think, uh, again, um, any purification process that uh, improves the quality uh, of the water going into the boiler is, is a good step. And, and certainly engineering departments will fit softeners to the feed water systems uh, because um, it, it then avoids them having to dismantle the boilers frequently to remove the, um, the fur that uh, builds up on the, the heating systems. But again, softening hard water creates bicarbonate, as I mentioned, and that in turn will create carbon dioxide mixed with the steam and potentially um, <clears throat> a non-condensable gas problem. So in my view, I think it's better to use uh, purified water. And if, if you've got Many newer sterilizers will have a boiler fitted or a boiler system fitted next to them in the plant room. And that then allows the sterile processing department to actually use the purified water system that is going to feed the washer disinfectors, the, the endoscope reprocessors, all the other uh, uh, plant that will use purified water in, in an SPD. Uh, that allows them then to use that purified water to feed the boiler. And that that sounds a costly exercise, but actually, if you do that, you, you will make savings in other areas. So you probably won't need to strip the boiler down quite so often to do maintenance because you're using pure water. It won't get clogged up with residues and so on. So that, that's typically the answer. Yeah, and I, I wish I could record that little snippet and take it to facilities departments that I've worked at before because just about every facilities department I've ever worked in, I, I would suggest that, that pure water for the boiler. And they would say, well, we put in water softener, so it'll be fine. And I was saying, well, if you look at my instruments, they're brown, which they're not supposed to be. Uh, the inside of the sterilizers are brown. But yes, that pure water, that's excellent advice. And I would advise anybody out there who's struggling with those things uh, to take that advice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kirk. Uh, that was a very yeah. engaging. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was about to say, I think in, in if you're in the process of uh, installing a, a, a more modern installation, then really the idea of using house steam or hospital steam uh, for the sterilizers is probably um, not such a good idea when, when you can potentially you can use the house steam as a heating medium to create pure steam. In a, in a different generation system. There are a lot of uh, what are called flash steam generators nowadays, which uh, use house steam to heat purified water and generate pure steam uh, almost uh, in situ. So again, if you're having a new installation, look at local steam generation rather than 
planning to use the, the hospital or house steam that uh, is typically piped around all hospital sites. Excellent advice. And that, you know, that, thank you so much for saying that because that's something that, you know, I felt personally and I've had people suggest that to me before and have had a lot of issues with, but it, it's really good information and such keen insights on the really, really important topic in sterile processing. Uh, if you have questions we weren't able to get to, uh, you can connect with Dr. Kirk via email, and I'm sure he will gladly answer them. His contact information yeah. is on the right hand that's corner of your screen. Uh, there will be a short 15-minute break before the next session. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you soon for a discussion dedicated uh, to everything you want to know about pouches for sterile uh, barrier packaging. We'll see you back in 15. Thank you.